For years, I, along with my wife, pastored several congregations in the Spanish-speaking areas, have had the privilege of traveling uh, quite extensively, and uh, miss that at times. And on one visit here in the United States to a congregation in San Antonio, Texas, some of you on may have remembered this, during their trip there after services, I began to field a lot of questions from brethren about how were things going in the Latin America sector. People were interested. They, they are. They still are. Some great conversations uh, came from that, I remember as well. I also, uh, that day, uh, received a couple questions about a comment I had made during the sermon message that I gave, asking some technical aspects from the Word of God. I remember those questions. You may say, well, why do you remember those questions? Well, some of the messages I'll be giving, we'll talk about some of that. While in... Columbia, South America, one Feast of Tabernacles. There was a group of folks, I remember, asking some very poignant questions by some who had attended the service that day. They were not members of the fellowship. They had come and heard about it and visited. And those were even more difficult to answer because the phrasing was different in the Spanish Bible. You may not think about that, but when you translate, it doesn't always translate exactly. And so, as a pastor, I also receive email and phone calls from people that are beginning to understand the Word of God in this way of life. Sometimes their questions are very basic. What day is the Sabbath? That's easy, Saturday, okay? Sometimes they're rather complex. And so... You just never know what type of questions are going to come up. Sometimes it takes me a while to answer a question. Sometimes I have no idea. Many times I have no idea of the answer. Sometimes I have to do a lot of research. And there's a lot of material to research. And folks have all kinds of opinions. And you have to separate opinion from actual fact. Or what somebody states. Sometimes... I desire to give the person asking the question time to reflect on why they may have asked it. So sometimes I just look at them and go, don't say anything. And they ask the question and I'll say, well, what do you think? You know? But sometimes I'll say, well, why don't you do just a suggestion, maybe do a little bit more research and then we'll discuss it. Because what I've learned all too often over the years, a rapid answer by someone who claims to know everything, you don't learn from it as quickly because you don't have to prove it. You just, okay, you said it, it's got to be right. And that leaves you at a deficit. Sometimes the mere volume of questions, this will happen. I can't answer them all, or you can't, or we can't. A person may ask a question, and as you're just ready to answer that one, then they have another question, and another question, and another question. And all of a sudden, you've got 10 or 12 questions, and you're like, I forgot what the first question was, and now you're on to this one. And sometimes I'll say, whoa, 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 just let's do one or two questions, but let's answer this one first. Have you ever noticed how little children are very curious my granddaughter is getting older, and I'm watching her develop and grow and learn, begin to learn the words and the English language, and hopefully she'll learn Spanish too. I'm going to work with her parents on that and with her. And they're seemingly always asking questions as they get older. For example, these are ones parents always answer. Where do babies come from? Why does it rain so much? Why do I have to go to school? When can I drive the car? When can I get my driver's license? How can I be more popular and well-liked at school? Why do I have to go to bed? It's still light out, especially in the summer months. What time is dinner? When are we leaving? They're constantly asking where, why, how, when. 
I remember my children, why, 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 why? And I didn't think it would ever pass. It's okay to ask questions. And there are major questions of life that have been asked over the lifetime of man. In fact, since the creation of Adam. See if you recognize any of these questions. Who is God? Simple answer. Ask that question to some that walk this earth with us today. Who is God? What is his plan and purpose if there is, if you believe there is a God? What's his plan and what's his purpose? What is man? You'd be surprised with that answer if you ask that question. What is man? Why were we born? Why were you born? Is this a collection of anecdotes and stories that somebody made up? Or is it God's inspired word? Is the Bible His Word? Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow suffering? Here's one. Why are there wars and conflict where people die by the thousands? Thankfully, there's no wars going on right now. Really? And just because the news media doesn't report it doesn't mean there's not. Wars and skirmishes and all the things, genocide and killing still going on. Here's one. We live on the Gulf Coast. Why natural disasters? Or why disasters? We were talking about this yesterday over coffee. Several of us here. Why do the innocent suffer? In my decades of being part of God's church, His body, the ecclesia or the ecclesia, these questions have been asked, and some of them answered over and over in sermon messages, Bible studies, articles, and in conversation. But some of them have not been completely answered because we don't understand the answer completely. Now, some of you say, well, I, I could answer every one of those. Well, great. When you read through your Bible, when you read through this, you discover that God's servants, the servants of God, the people of God, they ask a lot of questions. I did a Bible study a few years ago. I went through and I said, I want to find all the places where somebody famous that we would all know the name, and if they're in the Bible, if you've read it enough, they're all famous or infamous. <laughs> but they, I want to know why they ask questions. Because I ask a lot of questions. I used to irritate. I still irritate people. I ask questions. I don't just say, well, somebody told you that, so it's got to be right. The people of God that are recorded in His Word, they wanted to know answers. And if you're like me, you too would like to know the answers to a lot of questions. I still have a lot of questions. I really do. A very simple one that has nothing to do with the Bible, I don't think. Why did God create fire ants? Okay. I have a lot of questions to ask God someday when we're changed to spirit beings. We also understand that God likewise, stay with me here, He asks and has many questions as well. Did you know that? Well, He's omniscient. He knows everything. Sometimes He chooses not to. But He asks questions. He asks a lot of them. Have you ever thought as to why? The word why, W-H-Y, is mentioned over 430 times in the New King James Version Bible. God does not always answer our why questions, but He does understand our asking them. There are some very important lessons that you and I are to learn when God doesn't always answer our questions. Do you know that? So what should we do if we don't receive an answer to our question? Because 
A very famous individual within the confines of the church of God was known to say, that is a non-question. And I used to say it as a student, no, that's a question because I'm asking it. Right? What should we do if we don't receive an answer to the question? Here are some questions humans have asked about God, and we're going to look at a few here today. These are questions that humans have asked of God. Notice the story of Naomi. Let's go back to the book of Ruth. And some of this I may just uh, go over quickly. My Bible must have gotten wet. The pages are all stuck together today. So I may just have to refer to it, go from memory here without turning to it. They're really sticking. Oh, maybe I spilled something sweet on it. I'll try it one more time, see if it'll break. There it goes. Okay. Ruth chapter 1. Now, I want to read just a few verses here because... These are some interesting questions humans have asked of God. In the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. And he and his wife and his two sons, and the name of the man was Limelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of the two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephraites of Bethlehem, and Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah. And the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Kilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So, you read through, she basically lost almost everything, her husband and her two sons, and she was living in a foreign country. You may have thought, okay, well, so. In verse 8, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, and you have dealt with the dead and with me. So she asked her daughter-in-laws to return home to Moab. We go down to verse 19, and I'm just covering the highlights. The two went till they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? So the people said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And I went out full... And the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So she went out full, and she returned empty. So? So? Anybody ever feel like that? She said, call me Mara, which means bitter, not Naomi, which means pleasant one. Let me ask you a question. What if you lost everything? Maybe you have at one time in your life. What if you lost everything? Would you be bitter? Would you accuse God? Would you probably ask God, why? You ever done that? If you haven't, you're better than me. Said God, you know, was it Chris Christopherson wrote, Why Me, Lord, What Have I Ever Done to Deserve Even One of the, you know, the song? Naomi probably never knew all the answers, but God had something in mind. Her daughter-in-law, Ruth, became the great-grandmother of David in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Pretty important. There are, in the book of Job, Move to Job. Go to chapter 1 if you'd. Let's go there for a minute. <clears throat> J 
Job is an interesting book because there are 300 questions asked in the book of Job, and most of them unanswered. Wouldn't that be frustrating? If you had 300 questions that you couldn't get answered from anybody, would that be frustrating? In Job chapter 1, just to summarize before we go through a little closer, in Job chapter 1, this is the short version, this is the Cliff Notes version. Job lost his entire family and his fortune. Anybody lose your family or fortune yet? Some of us have lost things very dear to us. Job chapter 2. So he lost his family, everybody died, and then all of his money and his fortune and a way to make a living. So wouldn't you think that would have been about enough? Job chapter 2 and verse 7. So when Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, when he, he went there, he smote Job with sore boils from the soil of his foot unto his crown. I don't want to go into too great a detail except to tell you I had boils as a child, many of them. They are excruciatingly painful every time your heart beats. Boom, 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 boom. You feel that. They really hurt, and I've had them on various places. One of them I had in a knee that had two different openings on it, and the core was inside connected. And I had to get that out so it would heal. I have never had anything hurt so bad. But in verse 13 it says, they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and nobody even spoke unto him, for they saw his grief was very great. Have any of you ever had somebody say, I'll just sit with you for a week, 24-7, and be with you as you go through your trial? No, they usually say, I'll pray for you, you'll get over it. And I'm not making light of praying for someone. You ever had someone say, look, let me come sit with you. I'll stay here. I'll just sit in the living room. You, you ring the bell or snap your fingers when you need me. Or just sit with someone. Right? He personally suffered with boils. Horrible. Job chapter 3. Let's go on. Job chapter 3, verse 11. So Job begins to ask questions. Job chapter 3, verse 11. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the spirit when I came out of the belly? Why didn't I just die then? Why did the knees prevent me, or why the breasts that I should suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then I had been all at rest. Verse 16. Or as a hidden untimely birth I had not been, an infant which never saw light. Verse 20, wherefore is light given to him that is in misery and life unto the bitter in soul? Verse 23, why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God has hedged in? He said, why didn't I just die at birth? The trial went on for a long time. It was a long-standing trial. Job chapter 10. It gets better. Job chapter 10, verse 1. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say unto God, do not condemn me. Show me wherefore you contend with me. Just explain to me what's going on. Is it good unto you that you should oppress, that you should despise the work of your hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Have you eyes of flesh, or see thou as man sees? Are the days as the days of man, or are your years as man's days, that you inquire after mine iniquity, and search after my sin? You know I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver out of your hand. Why do you oppress me, God? In verse 18, he goes back to remind him, Wherefore then have you brought me forth out of the womb, O oh, that I had given up the Spirit, and no I had seen me? I just died. Should have perished at birth. 
Job chapter 13. I don't know, maybe you can't relate to any of this, but I'm venturing that some of you out there, some of you here, and I can relate to some of these verses at some point in your life. Job chapter 13, verse 14. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand? And verse 24. Wherefore do you hide your face and hold me for your enemy? He felt God was his enemy. In verse 15, there's an important lesson in this verse. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. Here's some questions I want to ask. Do we trust God even though we don't know why certain things happen to us. We ask, why did God allow my baby to die? Why can't I find a job? Doesn't God see that we have needs, that we can't pay our bills? Why hasn't God helped me get a job? Why hasn't God healed me? Why am I always having health problems? If you're healthy as a horse, you eat right and you exercise and you always feel good most of the time, you're going to have difficulty understanding someone who everything you eat makes you sick. You will. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying, isn't it funny how when you get fired or lose a job and can't get a job, you all of a sudden understand someone's predicament. Or when you go through a divorce, what that's like. When someone is crying and just said, or devastated and doesn't know what to say and said, my mate left me. And maybe you've been married for 50 years and never had a fight. Right? We don't always know why God doesn't answer immediately or when we want Him to, do we? In Job 21, Job kept asking questions. That was Job. Job 21, verse 7. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, and are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. You know what I've heard so much this last year? How come this president's out and this one's in? Not fair! Well... That's a question. And God hasn't answered it. But you know what? He has answered it in His Word. If you look for it, you'll find it. If I say the answer, you're going to get mad at me some will. So I'll just say, look into God's Word. He answers that question. Let's keep reading here. Let's see what we can learn. Their bull genders, their fails not, their cow calves and casts not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in the moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of your ways. Have we heard any of that? What is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto Him? The question is, why do the wicked prosper? They don't seem to have the problems that we have. They do, you just don't see them. And some may not have problems. You ever heard the saying, you were born with a golden spoon in your mouth? Some of us didn't even have a spoon, right? But maybe we did and we didn't know it. 
He asked in verse 15, what profit is there in serving God? If you've never in your Christian walk asked that question, then I commend you. But most of us have. What do we gain in this life? You see, God is not working with the world presently, calling them. He causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. God is dealing with His children, His servants, working with them. He's interested in developing our character, as I gave in a message recently. And He's always going to do what is best for us to help us obtain and be part of His family and in the kingdom of God and through eternity. Because He wants us in His family and to give us, as Paul wrote, penned under inspiration, a better resurrection and to be able to serve and help others for eternity. When we were sitting here talking yesterday, one of the folks here was talking about their past. And what kept going through my mind is you are going to be the go-to person for folks that have had a really difficult life because they're going to understand what it's like and you're going to be able to help them. Notice another servant of God, David. David never had any questions, right? He's going to be king over all the Israel in the future, all of Israel in the future, yet he had his struggles. Psalm chapter 10. Psalm chapter 10 and verse 1. Psalm 10 and verse 1. David had lots of questions for God. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? When I really need you. Where are you? I've gone through times in my life with challenges and different experiences when I would have given anything to have one person say, I got your back. I'll stand with you. And they didn't. They didn't. He said, why do you stand? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Boy, if you ask God that, bam, you're dead. He's going to smoke you, right? Just kill you instantly. He didn't. Verse 13, Wherefore does the wicked condemn God? He said in his heart, you will not require it. You have seen it, for you behold the mischief in spite to recrite it with your hand. The poor commits himself unto you. You are the helper of the fatherless. So, it says God is our helper. Matthew 6.33 says we are to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. That doesn't mean He's a genie pocket God that just, you pull Him out, okay, fix this problem, then you put Him back. He says He's our helper. Sometimes the help is not answering our question. We seek God's kingdom we want to be in His kingdom, but we do we seek His righteousness or our righteousness? You know, we can become righteous in our own eyes. You know how you do that? Think about it. How do you become righteous? Because you begin to seek what you think is what is right, and you do what is right. Yes, you need to do what is right, but you need to make sure that why are you doing it? Who are you doing it for? Who gets the glory? Who gets the praise? What is the purpose of it? Psalm 42. Again, we're talking about David. Psalm 42. Psalm 42 and verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted in me? Hope you in God, for I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. Verse 6, O my God, my soul is cast down, therefore will I remember you from the land of Jordan and the Hermonites and the hill of Mizar. And verse 9, I will say unto God, my rock, why have you forsaken me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Why have you forsaken me, God? And yet he says our hope must be in God. God wants to know that we will put him first. 
We can give him lip service, but when your whole life somebody dumped your groceries out in aisle six of Walmart and it's flying all over the place and you got no new bag to pick it up and maybe your back's so bad you can't bend over, what do you do? We are to love God and obey Him even if we don't understand why God commands it. Many have kept the Sabbath and the holy days for years without fully understanding the purpose. But many, and some I've talked to, have said, I don't know why I did it. All I could read was God said to do it, but I didn't understand it. But He said to do it, so I did it. God tells us to do things at times that humanly we don't understand or see why but he says do it i reminded someone recently said i'm tired of god telling me what to do talking about the bible i said well look at the bright side he hasn't asked you to hide your underwear in the rocks yet or lay on one side for two months and then flip over on the other side for another month there's a lot of things he hasn't asked us to do What he did say was, take up your cross and follow me. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lead to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. That's a mouthful. Our limited understanding does not nullify God's wisdom and understanding. If we know the will of God, then we need to do it. Then what is the will of God? We know what His will is. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added. John chapter 6, verse 63. Go there with me, John 6. Again, we're thinking about David. John chapter 6, verse 63 It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. Did we read that? It's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's words are and give us life. John 17, 17, God's Word is always truth. We were talking about that yesterday. Wouldn't you like to sort through everything going on in the world right now and say, what is true? Just tell me the truth. I think I don't like you, you're ugly, and if I never talked to you again, I would feel a lot better. Ow! But it's better than, love you, brother. And then you turn your back and in goes the knife. Like if you remember the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe where that little thing went right under his armor. Just enough, I think, into his lung or whatever it did so there's no way he could survive. Slowly die. Didn't stand a chance. Didn't that just make you go, oh. Right? Psalm 44. Let's go back there. Psalm 44, David again asking these questions of God. Psalm 44, verse 23. Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust and our belly cleaves to the earth. Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction? Does God really forget our afflictions or hide His face? No. God wants us to learn to trust and rely upon Him. Abraham did not fully understand why God wanted him to leave his country and go into the promised land. But he did it because God said, go do this. 
How many of you have had a boss at one time say, Bruce, you got to go do this or you're not going to be employed here anymore? And you're like, are you kidding me? Maybe that never happened. But if any of you have had a boss, at some point you've thought, are you kidding me? Right? Maybe your mom and dad or maybe your husband or wife, I want you to go do this. And like, are you kidding me? I ain't doing that. Right? And God says, I want you to do this. And you're like, think about Moses. Chose to give up all of that power and prestige to what? The affliction with the people of Israel for how many years? I think it calls it a season. <laughs> A long season. You ever ask God the question, okay, I'm committed to this way of life. I agreed to it, baptized, got it. Let's do it. And then he says, okay, things are going good. Now let's, I want you to go here. And you're like, whoa, what'd you say? I want you to go here. And you say, no, I'm good here. And he says, <laughs> You going to do what I ask or am I going to help you? And you're like, why? And we may never know the answer to that until this flesh is done in the resurrection. And then it, he says, here's why I did what I did. This is why you went through what you did. Well, how come they couldn't instead of me? God says, because I want you to do it. These are questions. I, I don't know. I just ask questions like I want to know. Let's, we're, we're talking about Moses. Moses and Israel. Let's go to Exodus 14. Verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. Behold, the Egyptians were coming after them, and they were sore afraid. If you want to know what sore afraid is, read the three little pigs. And the wolf puffed and he puffed and to blow their house down and the the pea, uh, the pea little twigs. The three little pigs were sore afraid. They were scared to death. Their knees quivered. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Let's keep going. Verse 11. And they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, you have taken us away to die in this wilderness. Where have you dealt with us to carry us out? So right away they turned and attacked Moses. Is not this the word that we told you in Egypt? Have you forgotten? You have Alzheimer's? Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Talk about fallacious reasoning and dysfunctional thinking. So what did Moses say? Don't fear. Stand still and witness and observe the salvation of the Lord, which He will show to you this day. For the Egyptians who you have seen, you're not going to see Him ever again, forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Translate that. God's got this. Shut your mouth. Quit complaining. But He didn't lecture them after that. Why have you so dealt with this? Why? Because they lack faith. They couldn't see what God was doing in their lives. They only looked at the physical circumstances. Do we do that? You want to know what's going on in the world right now, in this nation? God's not off sleeping or on vacation. How are we going to deal with this? It wasn't supposed to happen like this, God. You promised. Did he? Did he promise that he would always bless someone who thumbed their nose at him? The Israelites looked at the immediate and the, not the long-range future, the long-range. They looked at what they could have right then. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 12, please, with me if you would. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, 
Seeing we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. That Greek word hupomon means a cheerful, hopeful endurance. You just keep going. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're traveling seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, stop and rest, and if you have to sigh, but don't quit. I think that's a poem somewhere. Exodus verse 15, God asks, Why do you cry for me? God wants us to follow Him, trust Him, and obey Him, and stop looking at the physical. But you know what? I don't know about you. I very much look at the physical sometimes. I look forward to that breakfast in the morning. I woke up about 4 o'clock this morning. My tummy was, rawr, rawr, rawr. I was starving. I got up and ate some celery. That didn't work. It said, it needs physical. I'm hungry. Tengo hambre, as we say in Spanish. I have hunger. You know, many of the great miracles of the Bible, there was divine intervention. What seemed to be hopeless situations, the parting of the Red Sea, that wasn't small potatoes, the man in the wilderness. Manna means what is it? <laughs> it wasn't like the dinner you had last night where you could tell it was what it was. How about water coming out of rocks? The fiery furnace? Daniel in the lion's den? Oh, nothing, right? I've been at the zoo when the male lions, particularly, and you hear them, the hair in the back of your neck goes up, and you're like, I am so glad there is a big cage there, and I'm here, and they're there, and they're walking, you know? Exodus chapter 32. Let's go back there a minute. These are questions. And Moses asked these. Exodus 32. Verse 10. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax not against them that I may consume them and I will make you a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord as God and said, Lord, why is your anger so much against your people, which you, you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty, mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains, consume them from the face of the earth? Turn you from your fierce wrath and repent of this evil against your people. Hi, ay, ay, you tell God, what were you thinking? You need to repent and change those thoughts? He did. That's the kind of relationship he had with God. He said, you know, why does your wrath burn against your people? Sometimes God allows difficulties because we disobey Him. We put something before God in place of God, and it becomes our very own golden calf. Do you know that? We put something ahead of God. Now, we say we don't, but God says, well, you are. And when He brings it to our attention, we're like, no. Whatever it is, each one of us is unique. In Moses, another story, you can just jot this down, Numbers 11, verse 10 to 17. Moses said, why have you afflicted your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight? Because God knows, too, what our breaking point is. He said He won't try us, tempt us, put us through things that are beyond what we're able to handle. But we remind Him, I've had enough. I can't handle it no more. And He says, yeah, you can. You're my child. I'm going to strengthen you. You rely more on my spirit and less on you. And I'll show you what I can do. As he said to Zerubbabel, not by might or power, but by my spirit. 
There were lessons that Moses needed to learn because he had not come to the point of sharing responsibilities, one of the things with others. He was wearing himself out. Remember how he just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and going? And God said, think about what's happening here. We do that as human beings. We just push. Men are, I think men are more, have a proclivity of this more. Just give us a bigger hammer, enough C4, whatever it is. We'll take care of the problem. Right? And God says, no, that's not going to work. And we're like, it's always worked before. It's like, it's not going to work. You ever try to lift something, you can't lift it? i talk to the men here. You ever tried to lift something, you just can't move it? And maybe two or three people can't move it? Or you're like, if I just had this, I could do this. I could fix this problem. And you don't have it, and no one has it. We were in East Africa one year for the feast, and we had this makeshift lectern with these crates that were all not same size and bottles in it and board, and it was all wobbly, you couldn't touch it. I went down to the hardware store in Nairobi and I said, I need some drywall screws and some duct tape. And they said, what? I said, you know, screws, describing it. And it was a hardware store. There were no screws in the store. I said, okay, duct tape. They're like, like whack, whack. No, duct tape. It's, it's a type of tape that's real sticky and strong. I just duct tape it together. They didn't have any. I'm like, how can you be a hardware store? They're like, we're the best hardware store. We got everything except the two things I wanted. What about Gideon? Let's talk about Gideon for a minute. These are people that ask questions of God. In Judges chapter 6, in verse 12 to 14, Gideon asked, Why then has all this happened to us? Verse 1 it then says, well, because they had done evil in the sight of God. Many times, brethren and friends and family, you and I bring our own problems on ourselves. I remember growing up one time, my dad said to me, I said, why do I get in trouble with this and this and this? He said, because you open your mouth. Just be quiet. And I thought, well, you got to open your mouth. I ain't going to put up with that. He said, you got to learn to put up with that. I want to give him a piece of my mind, however little it is, right? When a police officer pulls you over and says, good evening, ma'am, and you're looking at him and he said, do you know how fast you were going? It's not the time to say, go get a donut, bucko, <laughs> or some other wisecrack. Or I got my rights, I got my video cam here, it's going to go on Facebook, go ahead. You just say, what would you like, my, my license, my registration, put my hands on the steering wheel, anything else I can help you with, sir? Or maybe he says, what's your name? And you say, Nunya. He says, Nunya, Nunya. Nunya business, not a good thing. Or what about if somebody says, why didn't you do this? And what were you thinking here? You just look and say nothing sometimes. Just be quiet. Right? As true Christians, are we constantly examining ourselves and evaluating our actions? It's easy to blame someone else for our problems, but sometimes our own actions cause those difficulties. We may blame our mate our boss, our brothers in the faith, our pastor, our fellowship, our government, our president, our fill-in-the-blank. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, do you remember what happened? What did Adam say? That beautiful woman over there, she caused all these problems because she gave me this thing and I had to eat it. It was her fault. Right? Isaiah 58, verses 1 to 4, they say, Why have we fasted and you've not seen? He said, We sometimes wonder. We have observed and kept the Sabbath. Have you not noticed, God? I can't find a job, but I'm observing the Sabbath. I go through the interview and get all the way through, and then 
they say, okay, you, you're doing great. We love you. You're going to be promoted in a couple more weeks, but I need you to come in Saturday morning and work all day this Sabbath, this Saturday. And you say, no. No. No, we discussed this when you hired me. I don't recall it. Or maybe you didn't discuss it when he hired you. Some people try that angle. You don't say nothing. You wait till you're going through and then you tell them, oh, by the way, much success with that approach, you know? But sometimes you get discouraged because you tell them up front, and they're like, we ain't hiring you. Well, I won't get the job. Would you like someone to work for you that took off Wednesday every week and didn't tell you ahead of time? I don't know. I'm just saying. Sometimes you need to go on the other side and put the, the shoes on from the other end and ask the questions, which is more helpful? Maybe we've asked the question, God, I've tithed faithfully. Have you noticed? I'm really like going in debt further and further. God, I've trusted you for healing, but you haven't healed us. God still heals today, by the way. I could share some stories with that, but not all the time. So then do we determine in our mind, well, God doesn't heal? We could cite all so many other examples in the Bible, what we're talking about, where people have just simply asked questions of God, and we have questions. Here are some questions now asked by God. You ready? These are the questions God has asked. Genesis chapter 4, we know this story. Genesis chapter 4, these two individuals. Verse 6. The Lord said unto Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? There's no need for this. Talk to me. What's happened? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and unto you shall his desire and shall rule over him. Why are you angry, he said. If you do well, you'll be accepted. The reason was Cain had a wrong spirit. He was angry. Why? He didn't do what God said, and he was angry at God for not accepting him. He also was angry with his brother because his brother was righteous and he was not. And the other difference is the offering he gave was simply a thank offering. And it's okay to thank God but Abel's was one of repentance. There's a big difference. Sacrifice of a contrite spirit and broken heart. When God intervened and asked a question, there was a purpose behind the question. God was trying to help Cain by pointing out his sin and the action he needed to take. And you know what? God doesn't ask questions just so he can complain. He asked questions for a reason. Jo Joshua, let's go over to the book of Joshua. Verse chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. The children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. It is not a good thing to have the anger of the Lord kindled against you. Achan sinned, and Israel fled in battle. In verse 7, And Joshua said, Alas, O God, wherefore have you at all brought this people Jordan to deliver us in the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would... To God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. Joshua's discouraged. The same one that says, well, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He was discouraged. And verse 11, or verse 10 rather, Joshua asked why. Verse 10, the Lord said unto him, Joshua, get up, wherefore you lie upon your face. You're a leader, get up. Israel has sinned, not you. 
And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded, for they have taken of the accursed thing and stolen, assembled, and put it even in their own stuff. He said, why are you laying on your face? Israel has sinned. Seemed like a little minor thing. Only one family had sinned, yet all of Israel suffered. Our sins and our actions can affect the whole group. Do you know that? We're a family, and God is concerned about it. And sometimes people say, well, it's okay if I'm doing this because everybody else isn't. God says no. In Judges, I'll just refer you to some other scriptures. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. The question asked, God says, why have you done this? God again points out their sin and the penalty for disobedience. There is cause and effect. I face things in my physical body that are an effect from a cause that took place 30, 40, 50 years ago. Someone asked me, I was walking the other day, and they said, you got a limp. I said, I do. I got more than one. And they said, how did you get that? And I said, oh, it's a long story. They said, well, no, short version. So I told them, and they said, so if there is one thing you could tell me to not have done, what would it be? I'd say, don't play football. (laughs) I loved it, but I said, don't play it. Because you demand so much, and a lot of those injuries don't show up bad until you get old. And then you're like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Right? I wish I had done things differently. I think we all can think about that. In 1 Samuel 15, again, you can just write these down, verse 18 to 23. He said, why did you Saul not obey? Why didn't? Because of rebellion. He said, rebellion is witchcraft. Stubbornness is idolatry. We don't normally think of those traits in this manner. When you're stubborn, you are putting something else in front of God. I'm not going to do this. Have you ever said this? I am not about to move here. There is no way I will ever do this for work. I will never talk to somebody like that. Fill in the blank. Now you stand still and you say, I'm not doing it. Right? Maybe a a husband and a wife are going through challenges and he says, I've got to get a different job. And she says, "If if you don't get a job that's making this amount of money, I'll leave you. I've heard that way too many times, and vice versa, you know. You just stubbornly say no. What if God says, this is what I want you to do, and you say no? You've placed something ahead of Him. In Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 27 all the way through 33, why do we worry about things? Let's just go over there quickly and look at it. This is all familiar, but... Matthew 6, verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, you just think about it, can add a cubit to his stature? You know, I was thinking about this morning. If I could just, I'm starting to shrink. And uh, my wife had to cut an inch off the bottom of my jeans so they quit dragging. So I'm shrinking as they get older. And you may laugh, but just wait a while. And, you know, I thought about, well, if I could just think about it, you know, Poof, I could grow three inches. I think about it. He says, which of you by taking thought can do it? And why do you take thought for raiment? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They don't toil, neither do they spin. You know, they don't sow their petals and dye their flowers and all. They don't do that. And yet I say unto you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is, tomorrow is in the oven, Can't he clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, take no anxious thoughts, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherefore shall we be clothed? Any of us ever do that? For after all these things do the nations seek. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this other stuff will be added unto you. God says you supply our needs. He just doesn't always tell you 
how and when and what our needs are may be different because our wants may be our needs. You know why God asks questions? To point out for us to stop and read and think about and give us the right approach and the right answer if we're open and yielded His Spirit to listen. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. I want to read this because this is a common challenge we can all face. Matthew 7, 3. Why do you behold? Christ said here, God says, why do you behold the little tiny piece of sawdust that's in your brother's eye, but you don't consider the huge telephone pole in your own eye sticking in there? You're worried about the speck in that person's eye. And he asks another question. He says, or how will you say to your brother, let me pull that big, you know, that thing out of your eye, that splinter, and behold the beam that's in my own. You're a hypocrite. He said, cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to cast out the mote out of your brother's eye. Take the telephone pole out, then you can help find the piece of sawdust in your brother." By your sister's eye. Answer to his question, we need to look at ourselves and not the problems of others. And again, Christ shows the proper perspective we need to have. We examine ourselves, and we're coming up to the Passover here. A few weeks. We examine ourselves and not others. My job as a pastor to minister is to serve and help. It's not to say, "Mm, now here's the things you need to work on. I got four pages right now. You're only at three and a half, so you're good. You're at 10. And I ain't started you yet. No. Because I know if I'm going to do that, you're going to do the same thing to me, and I don't want that. So we look in the perfect law of liberty, and we look in the mirror, and we say, I'm not going to compare myself to her or her or you. I'm going to compare myself to how Jesus Christ said I'm supposed to live. And the other thing is to not compare what you think is right, then judge others who don't do it your way. And we can be good at that. This last year has really brought that to the surface. You can judge everybody else because from my perspective, I know what's right. And if you do what I do, then we're all happy. The problem is if they do then what you think and you do what they think and it doesn't match, what happens? God also asks in Matthew 8, verse 24, verse 27, why are you fearful? Are we fearful much of the time? Are we afraid and lacking faith and trust in God? Let me say this. Are you afraid of a virus that's going to kill you? Some won't leave their house. They won't fellowship. They won't do anything. They're scared to death. That's not from God. There I said it. Hope you're not offended too much. Are you fearful? You can do your best, take precautions, but we're supposed to live, and you can't be a light in the world, an example, if you're hermitized. You know, get under a giant five-gallon bucket with a hole with a straw to get air and a little jar of water, a little food and a place to use the restroom and don't interface with anybody ever again. And maybe you'll live to a gripe old age of 114. Are we fearful? Matthew chapter 14, Peter doubted. He looked at the physical evidence, the storm, the waves, the wind. He feared. And brethren, fear is an enemy of faith. Doubt is an enemy, the destroyer of faith. Peter had very little faith. Let me, real quick, I want to look at on two other verses because Jesus Christ had questions. Do you know that? Jesus Christ had some questions of His Father. The most famous, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse 45. And we'll be talking about this at the Passover. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45. From the sixth hour, about 12 p.m., there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, until about 3 p.m. 
And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Apparently, when God placed the sins of all mankind upon Christ, the Father turned His back on His own Son. Psalm 22 prophesied it, but Christ stated it as something He had not known or anticipated. And yet He was willing to carry through with the work God had given Him to do to be a sacrifice for sin. Jesus gave Himself on the cross with His own question unanswered. You and I are to trust God even though there will be things we don't understand. We don't have to have all of our questions answered up front before we choose to trust God. Knowing God can be trusted should be enough. God needs to know and must know that we will trust Him for all eternity. We're going to always have questions as human beings. But friends, let you and I trust God knowing that someday we'll indeed understand the answers more, much more clearly. But until then, we have to trust Him completely. For He is our God. Join me in prayer if you would and rise. Father in heaven, we come before your presence. We've been before your presence here in worship services today. And your eyes behold everything. And we know that you know and care for us and love us. But Father, we're children. And children ask questions. And children want to know things. And you reveal many, but some you haven't and you won't until the timing is right. And it may not be in this life. But help us to be patient, to trust you, to say, Abba, Father, please take care of us, believe you. And Father, to grow in grace and knowledge because we do trust you and we do want you to live in us and through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in us to live a life that is acceptable as a disciple, a student of Jesus Christ and of you. So we pray your dismissal, pray your help, pray your encouragement, pray your love and mercy toward us. Bless the meal we're about to partake of and the various places we'll be eating and nourish us with it. Father, help us to continue moving forward, trusting you and loving you. We thank you and ask your dismissal now in the name and by the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen.